Hey duck fans, Kurt here from fishduck.com. Welcome to yet another Fish Duck 101 video podcast. You know, as, as duck fans, we're very spoiled. We have a tremendous amount of talented writers covering the Ducks beat, and today we're talking with the newest member of that sports beat from the prestigious Oregonian newspaper, Jeffrey Martin. Now, Jeffrey became a member of the Oregonian back in February, joining beat writers Ken Go and Aaron Fentress, covering all the news in duck sports. His work can be found in the Oregonian newspaper. Please subscribe. Or if you're an out-of-stater like me, you can catch all of his work on OregonLive.com. Thanks for joining us, Jeff, on the Fish Duck 101. Kurt, thanks for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure. Well, I think we should get the backstory first, get a sense of how exactly someone from Vermont and the New England area ended up all the way cross-country uh, with the Oregonian. What places did you previously work at? Where'd you go to school? Okay. Well, it's uh, you want to get, get settled in here because it's kind of a long, <laughs> it's a long <laughs> story. No, um, I think I've always thought, you know, uh, I'm from Vermont, like you said, but I, I always, we, doing what I do, you can't really do what we do in Vermont. My wife also works at the Oregonian, and so it's difficult that uh, the biggest paper there is the Burlington Free Press, you know, it's a good paper. Mm -hmm. Had a stint in Boston. I went to Boston University, by the way, so we got back to Boston. Go Terriers. Thank you, thank you. Greatest hockey program in the country. Well, I, <laughs> not lately, but uh, um, uh, so we went to Boston for a little bit. I worked at a, a high school sports website. wasn't really sure if I was in the whole journalism thing or not. Um, then that was when the whole internet with the stock options and they're giving money away like it was I don't know water. Um, and so the bottom fell out of that. And so then I was like, well, maybe I I am pretty serious about journalism. It's the only thing I was trained to do. So, no, in reality, uh, I, go, I went to York, Pennsylvania, home of uh, dumbbells, barbells, and peppermint patties. It's all true. They are all made there at one point. Um, I covered the Ravens there, Baltimore Ravens, about an hour north of Baltimore, York is. And uh, it was a great experience. Uh, one of the best bosses I ever had um, really basically just taught me how to write. Uh, Greg Bowers, now at the University of Missouri, uh, great guy. Um, so if you're watching, Greg, I gave you a shout. Um, and uh, though from there, uh, I went to Wichita. I went to Kansas, Wichita, Kansas, Wichita Eagle. I was the Kansas State beat writer. Awesome. And I heard uh, Bill Snyder. Um, so when people ask me, you know, hey, how's Chip to deal with? I'm like, if you've ever dealt with Bill Snyder, <laughs> you know, anybody else is a walk in the park. So. Um, did that for a couple of years and I went to Houston. Uh, that's where I just came from and, and I went there. Actually, it was hired to cover Rice Athletics. People were just like, wow, almost sounds like a demotion. <laughs> Rice fans hate me as, like, as I did then. I was replacing a guy who was virtually like a legend on the beat. It's a long story. Um, but anyway, but I was hired essentially as a stopgap and they knew I was going to be covering uh, the Texans before long and that's what ended up happening. And so I left there after having a uh, you know, having about a year and a half on that beat, uh, Jeff Mail, I covered him. Good guy. Houston Texans. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I had like a year and a half with Texans, and then uh, I came out here, and and honestly, I came out when I was covering K State. I came out for a basketball game. I sat down with with Chris Harper, and I'm sure people remember that story. Where Chris Harper was saying he's whatever. That was my story. So yeah. Anyway. Uh, so I came out and I remember just thinking, I loved it. I loved, I was like, wow, this is just like Vermont. And I remember telling my wife, I was like, I think we would love it there if we could ever get out there. And she loved the Oregonians, that was a great paper. And all this, and I was like, well, we'll see. And uh, as fate would have it, here we are. Frank Martin, yeah. the scariest man on the planet. Yeah. Uh, that case tech game was televised, and so mm -hmm. we were all watching it. And <laughs> the scariest thing we've ever seen in our lives was Frank Martin smiling in a photo during the the pregame warm-ups while they're introducing seeing frank martin it's like the psycho killer like trying to be like smiling makes it even creepier <laughs> frank is a teddy bear i <laughs> i tell people that they're like shut he's up the scariest freaking guy around. he is but like you know what like those, his kids those guys love him man they just adore him so um i know he looks like this monster and you know he tries to bully some media people but frank's a great guy he really is he he looks like uh, you know him and Vontae's perfect in in a, like a, a death match, 
<laughs> I take Frank. I'll I still be catch my I, I take Frank. <laughs> so you came to the Oregonian in February, which means you just missed out on football season, just barely. Yep. But yep. you've had a chance to kind of soak up the UO culture, both the basketball game and, of course, all, all the, the spring sports, baseball, softball, track, mm-hmm. acrobats and tumbling, lacrosse. Even though it's called Track Town USA, though, make no mistake, we are football crazy out in Oregon. So how much are you looking forward to getting your first real Autzen Stadium experience when September comes around? Uh, you know, someone asked me, I said, I went to the spring game. They're like, yeah, how was that? I'm like, well, it's a spring game. Yeah. You know, it's 43,000, but it's still a spring game, you know, but I was pretty impressed. I'm, I mean, everyone's told me it's a, something I have to see. And, you know, I come from the Big 12. I've seen, you know, A&M, that's ridiculous atmosphere, you know, Texas, it's not that great, uh, um, but no, it's not. It's not really. It really isn't. Um, but you know, Oklahoma obviously has a great atmosphere. Um, so you know, I'm used to you know big time college football. But you know, everyone tells me outs and something I have to see. So I'm psyched. I'm definitely looking forward to that. But you know what? I'm I'm okay. Like I, I just had a little a little bit of the track experience yesterday. Uh, I did the. Uh, the Prefontaine Classic, and I, I caught the bug, man. I'm loving it. So I'm hoping I can get some trial trials action, and I'm hoping Ken will let me, you know, because that's his baby. But uh, but no, I, I I love it, and so I'm, I'm, I can't express enough like just how happy I am to be here, and I think the people here are great, and I'm not politicking, I'm not doing anything. I just I don't know. I just I mean we're, we're blessed and. Um, and I'm loving it so far. Well, you came at a pretty amazing time. It's been quite a year in Oregon athletics. In fact, there's never been a year like this in the history of, of Oregon. They've had 20 national championships throughout the entire school's history and it's tacked on two more this year. And who knows, with baseball and track and field still active, might even be a third coming up. So what's it been like as a beat writer being able to step in during what has been the most successful athletic year in the history of a school one that already has a really proud athletic history probably well, makes it real like, easy to write stories <laughs> well yeah but the weird <laughs> thing is that like you know it's cool they've let me kind of ease right into everything because you know like you said when I got here I wasn't really immersed and so um, I haven't really done much with all the other sports I mean it's been funny though it's like every time you know you look up it seems like they are winning in a different sport and so <laughs> So that's awesome. And so, you know, with that said, I think moving forward, I think I am going to stick with football and basketball. I think those are going to be the two biggest things for me. Um, but obviously the rest of the sports, as you mentioned, and so, you know, that's plenty of, of terrain to cover. And so I think, you know, once I get more settled in and all that stuff, and it's been a few months, but I think that I'll have more, you know, I think you'll, you can look forward to having more of those stories and everything in, in Oregonian and Oregon Live. The paper's based in Portland, Oregon, and the school is in Eugene. So, in the months you've been there, rough estimate of how many times you've had to do the drive now between Portland and Eugene? Uh, well, not as many as Ken go. I mean, yeah. I read some tweet where he was saying, like, I could do the thing in my sleep, and I bet he could. Uh, but I tell people that all the time, like, you know, at K-State, I, I lived in Wichita, but Manhattan was um, two and a half to three hours away, and I did that drive. shut six hours, you know, round trip. I did that thing probably two, three times a week. So... I'm used to the drive. Everyone here is kind of rolling their eyes or like, oh, well, you know, we'll ask you again in December and so you get sick of it. I don't know. I mean, I just think it's part of the job. And, um, you know, I get a lot of thinking done. So <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing else to do. Very nice. Well, give it 30 years and maybe you'll be able to match Ken for a number of trips back and forth. I think he's got every pebble and bush oh, memorized along the roadside at this point. <laughs> Ken, Ken's a trip, that's for sure. <laughs> So what's it been like being a beat writer in the 21st century, where now every you know, schmuck okay. with, with a computer, like me, <laughs> thinks that they can be a legitimate journalist now, where you're, you're covering athletics for a newspaper in an era where day-old news often doesn't cut it anymore. You know, news breaks and because of Twitter and social media, an hour later, it's old. So how much has the life of a writer changed with all the you know, increased access that people now have due to technology? pretty amazing because I, I come off sounding as like like one of these like you know old fogies like you know <laughs> banged away on typewriter because just like five let me think uh 2000 i think i left the league in 2005 and that was my last time i was really really immersed in a beat and back then i was just dabbling with twitter like i was, like my my handle is no plug here i promise but like at jmar but i mean think about that think about how I'm sure thousands of people have tried, you know, tried to, to do that, you know, since 
Twitter's inception. Right. And that's my, because I have people who are like, wow, when did you get on there? I'm like, yeah, my <laughs> wife was actually, I mean, she's pretty pioneering, like, as far as news went. She had, at the Eagle, she had uh, one of her reporters, Ron Sylvester, was like one of the first people to, like, kind of live tweet a trial. And that was a huge deal. So they were going around and talking to people about, you know, how Twitter you could do. It was really cool. So anyway, I was just kind of sticking my toe in the water then, you know, 2004, 2005. And then now, like, man, if you don't, you don't tweet, I mean, you just don't exist. Well, and it seems like sometimes it can actually backfire and cause an yeah. oversaturation because when the slice of rumor starts before you go through the whole confirmation right. of information um, process, things are already talking left and right. Yeah. We saw in the off season this year, there was the rumor about Chip Kelly possibly leaving for Tampa Bay. Turned right. into a very sleepless night for Duck fans where yeah. there really wasn't any confirmation that reporters could you know could confirm out there it was yeah. just rumor back and forth but oh did twitter explode oh <laughs> did twitter yeah, explode the design for twitter you know and that's the problem is like i'm not gonna sit here and say like social media is this or that i'm not i think it's important i do i think it's great i think it's great for people to to connect i think anytime you can do that in society and have a you know it, i'm all for it but I just think in terms of our, doing our job, I think it makes it difficult. Now, I'm not looking for sympathy. I'm not doing anything. You asked, uh, you know, you said how any schmo, you know, with a computer. No, I thought I meant. <laughs> but I don't, I don't look at it that way. I still think, like, I'm all for that. I feel like, you know, the conversation has to is going to happen regardless. And so I guess my point is, how can I distinguish, how do I distinguish myself kind of in the marketplace, so to speak? And so I'm a firm believer that if you give people stuff that they want to read consistently, if you can be an informative, um, uh, entertaining, uh, newsworthy read all the time, you know, I feel like you don't really have to worry about, you know, uh, people getting their information elsewhere. They're always going to read you because you're going to have a different take or, or just maybe, in a, maybe people just enjoy reading you. You know, and that's okay too. And so, um, so that's kind of where, how I approach it. So, getting back a little bit to the changes in technology with now Twitter and social media being out there, in that now all of your work goes both in print and online. Does the necessity to cater your product to both audiences uh, affect the way that you write? Yeah, I mean, here's the thing: there's a, there's a, a phrase called kind of feeding the beast, and I think to an extent you get that lots a lot of the online responsibility. It's just you know, it's kind of like crank it out, put it up there because, you know, you want to be, uh, not necessarily, you don't want to be behind, but you know, it's a competitive thing. I mean, a B is competitive, and so you don't want to be lagging and, you know, people keep score of that stuff, you know, you know, internally or, you know, in their head or what. No, it's true. You know, people do. I mean, they, they you know, I mean, and, and that's fair. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you, it's hard because, you know, you don't want to be sitting there and making yourself, give yourself twice as much work either, you know, because, and so... I think there's this there's a delicate kind of balance you have to maintain where, you know, you got to consider both um, masters, so to speak. And, um, but I think, but I don't think there's anything new either. I, you know what I mean? And so I feel like, at least for me, and so um, I think that you just have to got to pick your spots a little bit. Like I like to take more of a a writer's touch, um, even with you know online stuff when I can, you know, but, you know, sometimes you can't, sometimes time doesn't allow that, so. Right, and of course, all of your material can be found on OregonLive.com, and all of the articles on OregonLive.com have open comment threads. Mm. There's always some very um, interesting opinions given each day uh, from, from readers. Do you ever scan through the comments to kind of see what people's reactions are, or are you just simply too busy working on the next article to even worry about what people are saying? Are you kidding me? I know everything. They send all of our, all those comments all get sent to our email. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so I see everything. So if people are re watching this and they think I don't see it, I do, but I don't, I just, I refuse to engage in that regard. If you want to, if you, I will, I also respond to every email I get. Okay, so it's a weird thing. Like, I'm not going to, you're not going to engage me in comments. Like, I'm not going to do that. Like, Ventress, Ventress loves doing that stuff. And I love that about Aaron. But he loves to argue. I don't like. I mean, I'll, you know, I'll have a reasoned discussion with you. But Aaron just likes to kind of, you know, debate and do whatever. And you can never yeah. win with Aaron. Yeah, it's <laughs> whatever. But um, no, I. But I will respond to emails if you, you know, coming at me that way, and we can do that all day. But I'm not going to do it in a comment field because I just feel like, you know, I don't. I just. 
I don't really see what the purpose is. You know, my work is out there. You can, you know, do with it what you will. And if you, you know, but if you're taking a chance to like, you know, you want to discuss something with me, then hit me on email. So. Okay. So uh, let's get into some deep, detailed journalistic expert analysis. Sure. Between Rhett the Boston University Terrier and the Oregon Duck, who would win in a fight? Oh, I hate Rhett. I despise <laughs> Rhett. I am on record like I. Oh God, I, I. You can ask all my friends, all the kids I went to school with. Like I just, I'm so anti Rhett. I mean, I was just like, let's get rid of Rhett. Like I don't even understand. The duck would kick Rhett's. Oh God, yeah, I'm <laughs> behind the duck trying to kick Rhett's butt. No, I mean, I. Yeah, I just, I don't, I don't think there's anything aggressive about Rhett the terrier. You know. <laughs> It's with duck. It's kind of cool. It's fun. I get it. And I don't know. Like it's just different. But Rhett, the t- uh, yeah. So well, and the fact you were down in you were probably in Houston at the time when uh, the Houston Cougar had a little bit of a run in with the duck. So people already know you don't you don't mess around with the duck. No, you can't. You can't mess around <laughs> with the duck, man. They're fierce. So see, now I'm just trying to kiss up to the duck. <laughs> thing that, but no. I hate red. That's that's okay. that's a fit. Well, you know, there's been a lot of talk this year because Oregon football practices are now closed. Yep. You know, they were closed over spring, and there's just, in general, very limited access to the football sure. team. We have to kind of wait until September to see what happens. So everyone is just speculating about what may or may not a, a, a occur. So how much more difficult does that make your job without a lot of tangible information available beyond what are the brief post-practice interviews and what you see in the spring game? If I'm being completely honest, uh, everyone's basically even on that stuff, so it's like it, it's fine, you know. To me, like, no, I mean I'm a storyteller, and so you know that type of stuff like doesn't. I mean it's not going to phase me. I mean I never complained about it. I mean K State, again I keep talking about K State, but it's only like you know in depth like the experience I can draw on, and like you know we never got time in the preseason. Like all through August, we literally had two opportunities to talk to players, two in a whole month. Okay, so in the whole month, like I mean that's I mean so you just had to be kind of uh, creative, and so again it goes back to that. So yeah, I mean I think I, I think it hurts you. I'm, again, I'm not someone who sits there and and is going to tell you all about the you know, what new schemes Chip's put in and stuff. That's you guys. That's Fentress. Like, that's not my strength. But I'm going to tell you about, um, you know, what makes partially kind of what makes, you know, Brian Bennett tick. Or I'm going to tell you about, you know, why Marcus Mariota is so laid back or whatever. But I, those are the things that I want to tell you in addition to the normal, you know, B stuff that you that you expect. Fantastic. Well, would you consider that your writing style, or do you have a particular approach that is the Jeff Martin wow. writing uh, style? It's trademarked. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, it, no, I don't. I don't know. I just. I. I think. You know what? I think. I. I think. I write stuff that I think that I would want to read too. You know, at least I'll try to do that. Like, I don't know if I could definitely say everything I've written in the Oregonian. You know, fits into that. You know, category. I don't know if that's the case, um, but I know that when I approach something i look at it in terms of like a has a story been told is there a unique way of telling the story there's some way that people are going to get some um some great entertainment value at it are they going to walk away being like oh i didn't know that um basically i just want people to read and be like okay i got something there i didn't know you know or you know whether it's stat or if it's a you know a fact whatever but just something i want people to learn read me and learn that's what i want terrific well Jeff, we sincerely appreciate you taking the time out to speak with us and the occasional links to Fish Duck content. It's always very much appreciated. Now, for fans watching, if you live in Oregon, please subscribe to the Oregonian newspaper. They do a fantastic job of covering both local and national news. And from a sports perspective, they're as good as it gets covering the Ducks, the Beavers, the Blazers, the Timbers, and national sports too. So, Jeff, thank you for joining us for the Fish Duck 101 video podcast. I don't know, is there a hand signal for the Boston University Terriers. I, I normally throw up an Oregon O, so. No, I don't have one. I'm just lame. A, a B, B, U. <laughs> uh, I, I'll, I'll just put up an Oregon O and say go Ducks. How about that? Fair enough. Go Terriers.